Awesome. Hi, everyone. It's Mitch Rollick here, and welcome to Ideas on the Verge. Today, I have a very special guest, Margaret Klein Salomon. Uh, but before we get started, I one word from awesome. our sponsor, Hi. New Society Publishers. They are proud to be celebrating 40 years of activist solutions oriented publishing from their roots in nonviolent civil disobedience training during the Vietnam War to today. They continue to bring positive solutions and cutting edge ideas to some of the most troubling challenges of our time. Committed to building an ecologically sustainable and just society, they walk their talk by printing their books in North America, never overseas, and on 100% post consumer recycled paper. They are carbon neutral and have been since 2006. All of their employees are shareholders and they are a certified B corporation. To find out more how they put people and the planet first, check them out at www.newsociety.com. And as I had said before, I have a very special guest today, Margaret Klein Salomon. And Margaret is a psychologist, a clinical psychologist turned climate activist and warrior. And today I would, um, well, I guess, First off, I'm going to try to not turn this into my own personal therapy session as a climatologist myself, um, but to um, really empower people with some tools that they can take action, um, whether that be super broad scale or day to day, everything else. So welcome, Margaret. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in during some pretty challenging times. Uh, yeah. How are you? Um, pretty good. Um, it is, it's an important question to be asking each other these days because whenever you look at the news, it's not that great. Like when I opened up my computer browser today, it was just top scientists warn of imminent ecological collapse. And all of this is so overwhelming and so overburdening for so many people. And it really wears people down because a lot of people feel quite powerless. Um, to make a change, even if it's in their own day-to-day -day lives, let alone actual the actual mobilization that we need. Um, but I think that we can have a discussion and hopefully foster some engagement and get people to feel a little bit more empowered. Um, and to do so, maybe you could talk about a little bit about your story and um, how you came to be in the position that you are in today. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and psychology was kind of my family business. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was also very much, I was embedded in a psychological community. So I really, I really love it. I really love therapy, uh, both I've, you know, it's helped me so much in my life and, you know, the process of helping other people. But as I was studying for my PhD and in New York City, I just started to become more and more alarmed by the climate emergency. I, I, even in the short time that I have been in New York, I mean, at this point it's like 10 years, but, but even in the few years I had been in New York at that point, I could mm -hmm. tell that the climate was changing. Rain was coming down in these short, intense bursts. Um, and now uh, just last year, uh, New York, uh, has been reclassified as a subtropical region. Um, so that, that's, that's an aside, you know, I reading, experiencing it firsthand, experiencing Hurricane Irene and Sandy, but also reading, like you said, these studies coming out about mass extinctions and climate impacts. I just, I started to feel like a red light was um, just like blinking in front of my face and that I couldn't, uh, kind of an unbearable pressure was building up until a good friend of mine said, uh, and so I started to think, okay, I'm going to start doing some writing about climate and I'll, uh, have a, psycho a psychology practice and I'll be a writer. Um, and my friend said to me, don't start a blog. Don't that like, don't go down that road. Discourse isn't enough. Think, what could you do to actually solve this problem? And I was like, I mean, it, I, my mind was totally blown. I was like, actually try to solve this. Holy shit. You know, like I, I, I want to do that. I never, I never thought about it like that, but I never, uh, I never wanted anything more once that possibility was pointed out. And that's what I've spent the last seven years doing is, um, 
first <laughs> a huge amount of research to try and understand like what is going on with mass denial in our culture and how do we intervene in that and what's and what do social movements do and how do they work and really what yeah what what i've been working on for the last six years through uh the climate mobilization uh an organization which i founded is the um introduction and the promotion of the climate emergency climate mobilization paradigm that says you know this is not this is not a normal issue that should be resolved with normal policies it's an existential threat to us all and mm -hmm. it needs to be addressed with a full-scale mobilization of our economy and society mm -hmm. what so what does the um what does this World War II mobilization look like to the climate climate mobilization. What um, what is expected of people? Um, and it's from my understanding, and as climatologists, it's well understood that this is uh, an engagement that needs to have literally everyone on the planet take take a part of. Um, for, for, doesn't matter where you are or really what you believe in. Um, so I guess this is a two part question: Is what does this mobilization look like? And What's the most effective way to to engage with people who are in a state of denial, who literally will just say, this isn't a problem. Um, I refuse to even um, analyze what I, my own habits are and how that's perpetuating uh, climate change. So how how can we effectively deal with a difficult conversations in that manner? All right, I got to take these one at a time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, what mobilization would look like. Um, first of all, if you if you want an in-depth answer to that, um, please take the time to check out the Climate Mobilization's Victory Plan available mm -hmm. on our website. It's about 100 pages answering that question, what this mobilization would look like. The best historical analog is World War II, um, which in during which we transformed our economy from a consumer economy to a war economy in just a few years. Um, through mass participation and uh, buy-in from the public, so it would so so it would look like a huge spending from the federal government um, in order to do things like mass implementation of renewables, of you know energy efficient building retrofits, of uh, public transit, you know, huge investment into the zero carbon economy, as well as uh, extremely aggressive legislation, such mm -hmm. as, you know, we don't need to just price carbon and use the market. This is, this is still a democracy and we can ban fossil fuel, ex the expansion of fossil fuels and set a early retirement schedule for the capacity we have now. So yeah, we advocate uh, an immediate ban on fossil fuel exploration or expansion, no new pipelines, no new export terminals, no new refineries, nothing. And, and a 10 year um, early retirement of that capacity. So the government investment in renewables during that time needs to you know, rapidly scale up and, and increased efficiency, but needs to rapidly scale up. Um, in order to meet our energy needs. So in, in agriculture, we need to uh, ban, phase out pesticides in five years or less to turn back the insect mm -hmm. apocalypse. Um, we need to ban factory farms. So it's, um, and we need, we need to transition farmland to permaculture, to, you know, restorative and, uh, you know, carbon negative uh, farming. So there, there's just a huge amount to do on every level. And yes, uh, participation from every person, both in terms of changing uh, you know, their own energy uh, habits and consumption choices, mm -hmm. but also through actively building uh, the new world. Yeah. So, um, and let me just say, let me just say, um, obviously to achieve that level of government intervention, we need a huge social movement. And that's oh. what that's what the work is now. Mm -hmm. um, so then to your next question about talking to a denier, um, and I want to put that in the framework of the social movement, 
that we're that we're building mm -hmm. that that does that does now exist the climate emergency movement that treats climate not yeah not as an issue but as an uh absolutely huge emergency um so in order to build power for that social movement i don't think generally is worth your time and energy to try to um, convert straight up deniers, you know, who have um, chosen propaganda um, and and lies. I mean, you whatever if you can and and if you want to, I would point to uh, the fact that the fossil fuel companies are the most profitable companies in history, and that they've invested billions of dollars in a campaign to get people to doubt climate, and you know. How, how do you feel about uh, holding the opinion that they paid billions of dollars to get people to hold? Does that, does that seem fishy? Um, but but uh, I, I, I just think that there's so many people who intellectually understand climate. You know, maybe they understand a little bit about the science or they trust scientists or whatever. But they, they manifest denial in a different way um, through just, you know, continuing to live as normal. Um, mm -hmm. And so those to me, that to me is the target audience. Pe like, like normal people, whatever people, uh, let's say outside of the Republican Party, outside of the Fox News propaganda machine, uh, people who, um, whatever, uh, good lib good liberals, liberals and leftists who, yeah, understand that something is wrong. Maybe something is very wrong, but lack both the uh, the courage and the like uh, scaffolding to kind of own that issue. You like know, the mental people, infrastructure almost it's just it's hard to get your head around it and make tangible action like we need to focus on those people yeah i mean climate has been classed as a science issue and i'm afraid that's really alienated a lot of people from viewing it as their issue and one that they are authorized to uh care deeply about and to talk about and to educate about that, I mean, because, you know, obviously climate science is critically important, but everyone has a stake in this. And science, you know, this, scientists have given us the information that we need. Um, it's not, I, I don't, yeah, there's, it's not, it's not particularly a lot of new information. It's like, oh, the crisis worsens. It worsens, it worsens. Yeah. So, um so yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I think that recruiting, um, you know, in, in for social movements, they talk about the spectrum of support. You've got active support, which is like activists. Um, passive support, you know, people who, yeah, they kind of agree. They're not. They're not against it. And then passive opposition and active opposition. So it's you know you want to move people along that spectrum, and so I'm saying basically move people from passive support into active support, mm -hmm. like, which I I think this is a moral duty, right? Like we are living in a time of, uh, just a huge, massive die off of uh, animals and species and humans, mm -hmm. and we have to try to prevent it. So that's I mean, that's um. That and, and the just self-interested, it's both a moral calling and like, if you want to have a good future, we have to change our trajectory. Our current trajectory is not good for anybody. Yeah, we literally don't have another choice. Right. So, so one thing I talk about in um, my book, which is published by New Society, Facing the Climate Emergency, how to transform yourself with climate truth is grieving the future that you thought you had. Um, yeah, yeah. But like as a as a young person growing up in the '90s, as a kid growing up in the '90s, 
I was told by my parents and my teachers and by like everybody that the future was bright and that I could, you know, choose, choose what I wanted to do, choose, choose my future. And it, coming to terms with the fact that the future is not bright, the future is catastrophic, the like, uh, you know, the nice life that I had planned being a, a psychoanalyst, having a family, writing books, sounded great. But if civilization is collapsing, I'm not going to be able to have a, have such a good time, right? Like, uh, so just, yeah, once you realize that the future that you wanted, that you had hoped for, is not going to happen, um, it opens up space for something new, which is like, a, a, which is a collective effort, taking part in a collective effort to radically change our trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, you're stealing the questions right out of my mouth because I was actually where I was going to um, guide, try to guide the conversations. Like, yeah, we have this, um, our hopes and dreams were based off this Leo neoliberal myth that we'd have this white picket fence house and everything would be great. And it was just progress, be, progress, progress progress and growth everywhere. It's going to be great. Trust us. Um, but you have to, you, have, you come to this truth and I have a couple of questions about how, how you came to that truth. So it was from my understanding through reading your book, it was hurricane Sandy and you saw a sign um, on a car and this conversation with your friend. And I'm just wondering, is there, is there almost like a five stages of grief for climate truth acceptance? Um, and just for some people, like how long can people expect to come to this truth? And when they do reach that truth, what's the best way to deal with it? And like, what did your family say when you're like, I'm going to start tackling this? I have a PhD in psychology, but I want to direct all my energy towards this. Like so many people are scared and want to live in line with their values, but like, how, how'd you do it? Yeah, great question. Um, okay, so in a multi-part question, I want to start, I'm going to start from the, the last questions you asked, which is <laughs> when I told my family, when I, when my friend made that challenge to me and I was like, oh my God, this is what I want to do. It was like a conversion experience. It was really, um, intense. And I had one year at that point, one year left in my PhD program and yeah. Uh, but I was so Im impassioned Im with the climate idea that um, I was thinking seriously about leaving my program, not not completing it. But but every single person in my life told me that was a terrible idea and that I should finish it, yeah. um, which I did. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, honestly, when I made this switch had this kind of conversion experience, several people in my family told me that they were worried about me. And I was, which I can kind of understand because it was, it was kind of drastic. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, I was like, no, don't, this is the like worst time to worry about me. I'm like, got my mission. I'm like, I got, um, so honestly, looking back, I really don't know how I had the confidence and such courage of my convictions about the climate emergency, climate mobilization paradigm that that like, yeah, that that this needed that the movement needed to use this in order to be effective, um, and that they weren't doing that. Um, so, but one thing, I mean, one thing for sure that's um, worth acknowledging is, uh, you know, the level of economic privilege that allowed me to take this kind of risk. You know, I always knew that I could move in with my parents. I didn't do that. Um, I got married and my husband has been instrumental in allowing me to per pursue a life of activism or, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the constraints people feel are real you know, sure, there's, there's also, you know, social constraints and confidence constraints and whatnot. But, you know, capitalism imposes uh, real limits on people's time and other commitments such as 
parenting or caregiving. But um, so not everyone can do what I did. Though, if you can, I think you should really give it serious consideration. Um, and if you can't, there are a lot of ways um, that with smaller chunks of time uh, or, or other ways of contributing like money or like, you know, if you have a meeting space or whatever. Um, yeah, there are other ways to join the movement too with the number one most basic thing being talk about the climate emergency. Talk about it with friends and family and colleagues and neighbors. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing that everyone can do. Mm -hmm. I feel like some people might even be surprised uh, about how other people are um, are feeling about it too, because um, it's it's one thing to antagonize people who are deniers and don't want to believe that this is true, and then there's another thing to support other people who are likely going through the exact same thing as you are, um, and which is a really hard thing to do right now, given that we aren't really supposed to be hanging out with. Um, friends and family, um, given this little piece of protein and RNA that's running around. Um, and I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the response to COVID um, relative to how they should be towards climate change? Is, I mean, for me, it's a little bit frustrating as we all, oh, we can we can do some things here somewhat effectively, depending on where you are in the world. So what sort of, um, can we learn anything from this COVID situation and apply it to climate change? Yeah, definitely. Um, the first thing I think is about the necessity of addressing existential risks aggressively and not waiting until they spiral out of control mm -hmm. to deal with them. Um, but there's other things as well, such, I mean, the best thing I can say about the COVID response that we need to achieve with climate is recognizing it as an emergency, which again, took too long, especially from the federal government. But when there is a real emergency, everything changes. So, you know, how, how, how many events got canceled and school, you know, and semesters that got canceled, almost all of them, all of them, you know, like, uh, and the newspaper reporting with the headline every day, you know, I, I, I had the unfortunate experience of launching a book during, uh, in April. And at that point, newspapers told us that they weren't covering anything but COVID, you know, nothing on the op-ed pages or whatnot. So, and so, yeah, we need, we need that. We need to recognize that climate is not like, oh yeah, that's nice. That's like a hobby or whatever, but something like every institution needs to be immediately grappling with this and uh, reacting. And uh, otherwise they put their uh, students and their stakeholders and their employees in danger. So that's the, that's the positive side, so to speak. But and the negative side, we've seen, God, so much incompetence from, uh, I mean, obviously the U.S. federal government, but other governments too, state governments. I mean, it's not it's not been pretty, uh, obviously, and it creates a you know a crisis of confidence. You know, are, can we can we still do great things? Is that possible? Um, and I. I think so. I still believe in the human spirit, but it just, it just shows how our institutions are just failing on so many levels. We need, it's not just uh, the climate emergency. It, it's uh, our society. I mean, we need transformation, not reform. Mm -hmm. That is, I, I think, a watchword for every part of politics. Um, yeah that the problems are so bad and the institutions are failing so completely that any any kind of slow solution is inadequate, <laughs> you know? So those are- Yeah, some. I think we need, we need a lot of transformation through disruption. And there's a lot of people who really want 
that to happen and it's just a matter of giving them the confidence and the means to be able to do so but i really like your comment on the human spirit and it i think it is possible for for deliberate action to be um made in the face of emergency i was um i'd been living in new zealand and i actually got on a last flight back to canada um which was an interesting time i i mean i've totally had to delete all of my social media because i can't see all my friends just hanging out actually living life it's it's i mean it's amazing they're doing incredibly well in the face like relative to everyone else but yeah it's certainly very um very difficult um in in your book you talk a lot about affect tolerance or your emotional muscle um do you have any tips on people who are feeling pretty bogged down by everything that's happening and what can people do to to increase their mood and give them um give them that human spirit that makes them want to take deliberate action the number one thing is self-compassion um that to to approach your emotions your inner state and and not just and you know thoughts feelings with non-judgmental self-compassion. Mm-hmm. So for example, you know, I feel grief about the climate emergency and and uh, and rage and terror and all so so many things, some of which are rational, some are irrational. And only by actually accepting those feelings and welcoming them at rather than judging them, deciding which ones are okay, which ones are too too dark, whatever, um, and trying to censor myself and my experience, uh, by, by welcoming all of those feelings, it, I, I know people, people are, I guess, understandably afraid of emotional pain. And the climate emergency is so huge that many people feel like they just can't go there. I used to feel that way. I used to open up an article about climate, read like a paragraph and just be like, oh my God, like, you know, like whatever, like I'm approaching a panic attack. I can't handle this X. Um, And so it's, it's okay to feel that way. It's understandable, but you can push past it. And the way to do so is, is through self-compassion. And I, I would also just, I would encourage people to push past that because you know our emotions are we can we can process them we can handle them they're they're not bigger than us but the climate emergency itself is bigger than us and is a much more dangerous threat so by allowing ourselves some discomfort emotionally we make it much more likely that we can actually protect ourselves Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely in, in the book, you said, um, or you quoted psychologist Daniel Gilbert uh, saying, humans are wired for a reflexive response to threats that are intentional, immoral, imminent, and instantaneous. Do you think s- some of the problems with it is there is a, per- a perceived lag in that instantaneous change? Like it, it, the effects are happening right now. They are widespread, especially in regards to like wildfires and hurricanes but a lot of the it's not localized on like a national identity it's not a threat to national identity almost is that a barrier at which um there is that is that a barrier yeah absolutely the the long time horizons of climate the idea that this is something that we need to do for our grandchildren and that we need to reach zero emissions by 2050 for example these are all um destructive narratives that confuse the public uh that we need to understand that climate is already killing people now and causing state destabilization and contributing to state failure such as in syria where they had the longest drought in their history followed by huge uh demographic shift in the country like subsistence farmers moving into cities because they could no longer survive on their farm anymore Mm -hmm. um and that that's really destabilizing so that amplified the threats the the divisions uh, in society and triggered a civil war that has been obviously just horrifically devastating Mm -hmm. so just to understand that 
This is happening now. The climate emergency is causing state failure and droughts and famines and floods and interrupting the food supply. Um, that, I, I, I mean, yeah, that anything, anything about 2050 or whatever, the far future, it's all, it's, it's really dangerous. This is, we need, we need to handle this right now. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, we need to handle this 20 years ago, but mm -hmm. we didn't. So we need to handle it right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do, is also, do, is it, is it possible that um, there's a lot of inaction because people feel guilt like they they feel they're complicit in it and then that that isn't a barrier in and of itself it's like well yeah but I, there's nothing i could do this is this is my life yeah absolutely and it's really important to realize that the fossil fuel industry has contributed directly to this to to this feeling of guilt with the uh you know control your carbon footprint um narrative that has passed on the blame of uh, climate change from uh, producers, the fossil fuel industry, to individuals in a way that has has just been really destructive. I mean, like, if you remember, this is a random memory, but if you remember the awesome kayak protests in Seattle that delayed oil tankers from leaving, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the, there, there's, there is all this uh, talk about Oh, kayaks are made from fossil fuels. How how are you going to protest, you know, fossil fuels when you are complicit in this economy? And that is such a um, just a really devious <laughs> tactic that has has worked. I mean, the fossil fuel industry has has put a lot of money into yeah, calculate and cut your carbon footprint, you know, carbon footprint calculator, all of this stuff because it's, it's about shifting responsibility and it does hold people back because people feel like, how can I talk about climate change? I eat, whatever, I eat meat, I have a car. So I, you know, wouldn't I, wouldn't I just be a hypocrite if I was gonna do that? And I, it, it, I just cannot say adamantly enough, no, <laughs> you didn't choose to be born into this system, this fossil fuel dependent economy. You didn't choose that. So the so the idea that some environmentalists try to like purify themselves and their consumption. And I just think that, you know, we live in a broken and deadly system and our energies are best spent transforming that system, not trying to carve out this little um, bastion of like goodness within this evil system um but really yeah working for change and that's not to say you know and and become vegetarian if if that works for you and you know stop flying if that's possible for you like it's not i'm not against people changing their lives but that should follow from political engagement and rather than uh it it, it is not a prerequisite get involved in politics first and then worry about all of that. Yeah, yeah, it's a big part about putting putting the world on your shoulders a little bit, and like, okay, I'm gonna take action and let, let that inform you and guide you in your in your journey for this. Yeah, like your responsibility is much greater than mm -hmm. just cleaning up your own backyard with your carbon footprint. Like mm -hmm. it's it's much greater than that. Don't and yeah, it's I I think when people just look at themselves like that. Oh, I'm going to be zero waste. I'm going to put a huge amount of time into that. Uh, it's like, it's, it's too small. You gotta, you gotta, um, yeah, we, we have, we have to do this collectively. We yeah. can't do it individually. Yeah. I mean, if you can inspire people to, if you take on this mission and be like, Oh, I'm not going to produce waste and you can inspire everyone else to do it. That's, that's fantastic. But you gotta, you gotta permeate that. Make some and like, cause in, in systems thinking like that, those small scale changes can really add up and make a huge difference in the world, which is really empowering. I think they need to be put in the context of politics, mm -hmm. right? Like, like you said, bring other people in. Yes. And 
uh, whatever it is, you know, uh, yeah, we're talking about zero waste, you know, you know, 10 friends tra- working on zero waste, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, make it political also. Yeah. Like it just, it can't, it, yeah, I, 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 it just can't be divorced from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you, you touched a couple times on um, fossil fuel industry propaganda. What are some other tools that are being employed by this industry that people should be cognizant of and can watch for like an everyday sort of life because they have such long fingers and tendrils that expand into all realms of our lives. So what what myths being um, perpetrated or perpetuated need to be looked out for? Well, one for sure is that uh, fossil fuel companies are like greening their operations and diversifying their portfolio with renewables. They're not. Um, that's, I mean, they're, they're not. It's, a, it's a, a trifling amount of money to these huge companies. Their business model is fossil fuels. That is what they will pursue. Uh, don't, so yeah, don't expect any change. But yeah, it's important to realize um, how incredible incredibly deeply fossil fuel companies have influenced all aspects of our politics and society. You know, the Koch brothers um, who mm-hmm. pioneered, you know, modern day uh, extremist conservatism um, were fossil fuel uh, business people, fossil fuel billionaires. And that's so the the they have their they have their heads in everything fossil fuel companies sponsor museums and endow chairs at universities our top universities are funded by fossil fuels it's really horrifying uh congress people are funded by fossil fuels right lobbying um ngos are funded by fossil fuels like they they have they're they're everywhere and um, yeah, the, the, the biggest lie, uh, that they tell you is that they should continue to exist long into the future. Um, and they should not. The only way that we are going to have a chance, uh, at getting out of the climate crisis is by, uh, shutting down fossil fuels entirely. Mm-hmm. In, in the book, you, you say the most important question that someone can ask themselves right now is what can you do about it and later you you go over some of the most important things you can do and I, I'm gonna I'd love to list them out and then have you say um, why that is so effective and how people can actually get started with that if that's right with you yes the most important things you can do are one join a local climate emergency group two declare a climate emergency three become a community organizer Four, start a campaign or organization such as yourself. Five, fundraise. And finally, volunteer special skills. So I, uh, awesome. I do want to add to that just um, to, to talk about the climate emergency mm-hmm. emotionally with other people. And uh, this is something that I recommend to everyone and that... I have created a tool to help with, um, which is a small group conversation called Breaking the Silence. Let's talk about climate emergency emotions. Uh, So participants in this conversation uh, watch videos of me, short videos of me, and then answer discussion prompts. So it's like a facilitated conversation, except I'm only there on video. And so it's people with their small groups uh, having having these conversations. And they've been really impactful so far. We're still fairly early. But I, yeah, I just want to invite people to come and have, you know, a open-hearted conversation uh, about the climate emergency that can surely help you have more um, to get this experience, you know, talking with strangers. Um, in kind of a, a, a guided way um, can, yeah, can help you be more comfortable um, talking with your friends, neighbors, colleagues, et cetera. Um, 
But okay, so that's the only one, that's the only recommendation for everyone. Uh, for beyond that, it's really, really personal, right? Where do I fit in? What is my area of most contribution? Um, but is it's something that everyone needs to ask themselves and kind of more than once, right? So, um, but some of the ways that I recommend considering whether they're right for you are um, declaring a climate emergency, getting, creating a campaign or joining a campaign for your local government uh, or other institutions. We've had municipal utilities declare climate emergency, um, churches. Um, so getting your local government to declare a climate emergency and then implement a climate emergency program, that is what the climate mobilization's key area of focus is. So if you're interested in that campaign, the climate mobilization is your first stop, or as well as uh, investigating whether one is already active in your area. Further, uh, I would investigate whether the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Fridays for Future, or the climate mobilization are active already in your area and uh, or as well as other organizations, you know, the, of which I don't know their name, but can be doing really good work. And uh, if they're in emergency mode on climate and advocating for this full scale mobilization, then excellent. Um, we need as many organizations, in, you know, in that paradigm as possible. Um, so yeah, looking into what is going on in your local area, particularly those groups, um, for special skills, uh, you got to think about, so there's some things that organizations always need, and that some of those are graphic design, uh, accounting help, legal help, uh, yeah, web design, um, and then fundraising. There's other skills, uh, when, when people are meeting more in person, event planning, childcare at meetings, uh, cooking, cooking for protesters. So there's, there's, um, there's a lot, a lot that needs to be done. And then finally, fundraising. Fundraising is something that virtually every organization needs. If you tell an organization that you want to raise money for them, uh, they're going to give you the thumbs up. And, um, and yeah, that it's something that many people feel very uncomfortable with. It's something that I personally really had to grapple with in my time building the climate mobilization. But it's really important. You know, we do live in a capitalist society, so we need to fund the organizations that are doing critical work. So if it's something you're willing to do, it's always a high value, high, you know, highly needed um, skill. Mm -hmm. Um, I got one more question before we get to the um, the audience questions, and with the, the way that we are conducting ourselves with our behavior and um, which feeling climate change, um, we're really doing a disservice to to younger humans. How can we most appropriately equip them with climate truth? What is the best way to talk to kids about this? Do you think? That is a challenging and not my um, exact area of specialization, but I will say that I think being honest in an age appropriate way is uh, your best bet. So meaning to say, yeah, it is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best thing is if you can honestly say, but I am doing everything I can to make sure that we solve it because I think one thing, one thing to keep in mind in terms of talking to children about climate, as Greta has said, the most traumatizing thing for children is not necessarily hearing that there's such bad news, but rather uh, trying to understand how the adults in their life could be putting them in such a horrible situation and mm -hmm. wondering, do they, do they love me? Like what, what is, what is this? Are, are they monsters? Um, so being able to really look your child in the eye and say, this is happening, but I love you and I'm, and, and I love you and I love, you know, life and humanity. And so I'm going to do everything that I can. Um, yeah. And to, and to involve your kids in activism. 
um, going to strikes, going to, you know, depending on their age, uh, you know, children have done some amazing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm just going to uh, shift all the questions to the audience now. There's actually quite a lot. Um, the first one is, what do you think of the work of Dr. Erica Chenoweth and her research showing that 3.5% of a population engaging in civil resistance has always been successful? Oh, um, I think it's really interesting. Um, social movements are something that I studied a lot in my uh, try, in trying to figure out how to make change. Um, I think not, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether uh, I've read some criticisms of that research as well. I, but I don't know. Um, I like, we need as many people as possible. 3.5% um, of the population in active support of a social movement. Maybe that, maybe that is enough. Maybe in the case of climate, we're going to need more. Um, one thing that I really want to see in climate is maybe the thing that I want to see is a national consensus that we're all in personal danger. Um, because like, like I think we have not, not a consensus, but we're somewhere close to that with COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that sense of personal danger and desire to protect oneself and one's family is a very important political force. So yeah, anyway, I'm not sure. Alrighty. I mean, yeah, even if like 3.5% um, people start growing victory gardens, that would make a big, huge difference, I reckon. Or more yeah, than- and especially if they're fully politically connected, which, you know, calling in victory gardens is really helpful for, but um, yeah. Yeah, okay, question two. When I ask climate scientists when the debate about anthropogenic climate change ended among climate scientists, they tell me that this happened in the 90s. Is that your understanding from scientists as well? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Easy peasy. <laughs> um, so where, I mean, a lot of where I from, I'm from, I'm from Alberta and I grew up in Alberta, which is basically the Texas of Canada. So there's a lot of oil and a lot of, um, I have a lot of conversations with people. So that are, I've had someone come up to me knowing that I'm a client, climate scientist and said, oh, Mitch, you know, you know carbon dioxide is good for the planet, right? And so where, where's this information? That information is likely coming from fossil fuel industry. Yeah, um, indirectly. I mean, the fossil fuel industry, God, Jane Mayer, her book called Dark Money really helped me understand this, as well as Naomi Oreskes' um, Merchants of Doubt. Um, but the idea, like, because they, they didn't choose one strategy. They choose, chose a whole, whole portfolio of things, including, or maybe even especially, launching these phony think tanks um, that that as well as media properties, but that, that they just lie. They're, yeah. they're so, so how, how exactly did the fossil fuel money filter through these propaganda networks and, uh, you know, totally sold out think tanks to this oil worker? I don't know, but yeah, I, I would definitely blame the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. I agree. Uh, this next question is from Colin Smith. How does generational wealth transfer play into funding this mobilization? Is the transition profitable? So during World War II, um, the top marginal tax rate was 94% on the highest earners. Uh, there was a major increase in the corporate tax rate and ba the meat, sugar, gasoline and tires were all rationed and everyone got a fair share. So those are some examples of economic policies that would be considered extreme uh, under normal circumstances, normal neoliberal circumstances anyway, but are become obviously necessary when faced with an existential crisis, right? It does not make sense to hoard wealth that 
can be then in a situation of collapse, right? We need to activate these resources. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering this question, but I would also just point out that um, the climate emergency itself is a huge uh, transfer of wealth and freedom and uh, everything from the future, uh, the idea of that we're colonizing the future, meaning treating it as a far off outpost that basically just gives and gives is totally exploited. Um, so yeah, I think the idea of changing that dynamic is also really important. So in reality, we need to give to be able to pave our way to an actual healthy future. Almost. Yes, we right. We, the, we can't we can't just use our resources now to enjoy the present or to like adapt and protect ourselves. It's mm -hmm. not we we need to invest in transforming our energy system and agricultural system and transportation system so that the future might have a chance. Mm -hmm. And and not just and again not just the far future, right? My future, <laughs> your future, um, yeah. Kid, your kid's future, if you if you have one or choose to have them as well. Um, Colin also asked how was World War II funded, but I think you just answered that as well. Um, but he's also asking, can this be community driven versus corporate drive and funded? What about profits to the people? So yeah, the other funding mechanism to mention during World War II is deficit spending. Um, which I, I mean, I think that the government should spend without limit to save as much life as possible. Um, I would suggest that, yeah, fundamental economic moral principle that we should keep in mind in all of this is that life is more important than money and we and money and the economy should serve life um, rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about some pretty major changes in our economy uh, in his book, uh, Ministry for the Future, sci-fi, cli-fi book, Kim Stanley Robinson talks about um, the central banks of the world issuing uh, climate currency, creating a new currency for sequestering carbon to, to pay out. So yeah, so thinking in terms of big radical shifts uh, in terms of how the economy and wealth works, I think are important. Uh, is there money to be made during a mobilization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, during World War II, it, it, the public-private partnerships uh, were the engine of the mobilization. And uh, yeah, the whole economy did extremely well. Um, it's, so yeah, uh, who's gonna do well during the mobilization? Bike manufacturers, renewable energy manufacturers, uh, permaculturists, you know, it's, uh, yeah, there, it's going to be a new economy. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, it's going to be crazy radical change. It's going to be pretty exciting. And I think it's already unfolding. I mean, Elon Musk just became richer than Jeff Bezos. Great example. Um, question six is from Rebel Rainbow Unicorn. <laughs> okay. Uh, but mass mobilizations like World War II were top down from the from the national governments of those nations who took part. How do we get them to do that? They are owned by fossil fuels more than they are citizens. Yeah. Yeah. No. Great point. <laughs> um, a couple of things. I do. I do think we need the federal government. Only the federal government can spend. Can deficit spend. Um, or fe federal governments can deficit spend, um, as well as, you know, have the best ability to implement the banning and phase out legislation that we need. So I think that building the most powerful social movement um, that the world has ever seen in order to force governments to enter emergency mode and uh, pass that kind of legislation and spending mm -hmm. is critical. But it's not just top down. Um, indeed, there's a large amount of local leadership uh, on climate so far and continuing into the future. And it will be on the local 
uh, level that these transformations are actually implemented. Um, so for example, you know, at, on the local level, changes in the building codes uh, mm. and retrofit of existing structures. Uh, and, in, and in terms of, yeah, zoning and creating uh, cities where people don't need cars because of public transit zoning um, and bikeability, right? These, so it can't just be top down. Um, and I, and I, and, and shouldn't be. I, the other thing that I'll say is I am very interested in the citizens assembly model, uh, people's assembly that Extinction Rebellion is calling for, uh, which is a replacement for uh, existing federal governments. The idea that climate, that the climate mobilization should be governed by random selection uh, of citizens rather than elected representatives, which is, sounds uh, really far out, but it does have a historical basis, both in ancient Greece and also in, it, it's worked very well in a lot of European situations. It's not as far out an idea as it is here. But anyway, I'm, um, I'm open to it because we need transformation, not reform. Our, you know, in the United States, Congress's approval rating is like fourteen percent, right? So anyway, I'm just open to new things. Yeah, I just want to say one thing on comments to your uh, comment on buildings. Uh, my last interview, E, uh, is working on building buildings that sequester carbon because he's taking carbon out of parts of agriculture that aren't being used and storing that in the buildings. If anyone's interested. His name's Chris Magwood, so go check him out. Um, question seven is from Broadband Productions. Are there any geoengineering programs currently going on around the world that, I mean, that was the question, but I'm, I'm sure you have a couple of things to say about geoengineering. Um, is, is, is this a geoengineering um, solution or is it a people solution, people-driven solution? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, open to certain things that would be called geoengineering um, that should be as low risk and reversible as possible. But we're in such a horrible situation with our climate, I, I think it may be necessary even, even with uh, drastic decarbonization action. But there's different, there's different things that you can do. Um, so for example, uh, carbon farming, biochar. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that would be considered geoengineering. I know that mechanical carbon dioxide removal is, but if we can, I mean, if right now we don't have a scalable air capture carbon dioxide removal uh, approach, but if we did that, you know, was cost effective and everything, I you know, I, I would support that even though it's mechanical. Um, and, but though, though the natural um, drawdown methods of reforestation, rewilding are proven um, mm -hmm. and, and permaculture, there's, this, so, okay, so that's carbon sequestration. Then there's other things that you can do like uh, try to add ice, re so try to refreeze the uh, ice caps by adding water to them in winter. This is an idea that, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not a scientist, so I, don't, I can't, I don't feel like I can really evaluate this stuff. But again, we're in such a desperate situation that I think we have to stay open to possibilities. Um, I don't think we can afford to foreclose anything. I mean, so then the the, one of the most daunting and kind of threatening perhaps geoengineering solutions or interventions is um, solar radiation management, you know, just injecting aerosols into the atmosphere to mimic a volcanic eruption and cooling particles. And I think, I don't know, it may be necessary, though it, it would certainly be terrible in its own right. Um, it's, you know, you can think of the metaphor of like chemotherapy, you know, if sometimes Sometimes the situation is uh, is really extreme, 
Um, that said, it would be totally suicidal to use geoengineering, but not execute a rapid a race to zero emissions across sectors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they yeah. could only be happen in conjunction with rapid decarbonization, or else it would just be stalling. Yeah. So I was say like probably the most scalable carbon sequestration method is regenerative agriculture and taking care of our soils. Like soil can hold so much carbon. I mean, a lot of the climate accounting doesn't take this into account. Like this is the solution is literally right under our feet. We can we can have such a huge impact with taking care of our soils. And that includes not killing our soils at every chance we get and just trying to grow monocrops and actually mimicking nature and creating ecosystems that have biodiversity and can take up our insects and have a cascading upward spiral. So there's so much possibility. There's, we have everything that we need technologically mm -hmm. to get to zero emissions. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. Transforming the agricultural system is just as important as transforming the energy system. Yeah. Um, and it, you can deal with the issues of food security as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we have we have what we need. We just don't have the political will, and we we're just not treating it um, with anything like the urgency it deserves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, a couple more questions. This is, uh, I, think I, I I actually have to get going shortly, but so. Okay. Uh, how many minutes do you have? Five. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask you the the one question that I ask everyone then. Um, and announce the winner of, of the book um, that we'll be giving away of yours. Um, in a hypothetical world, you have become the Minister of Education, and it's your job to give between one to three books to every graduating high school student. Which books are they and why? Oh my goodness, this is a really good question. Um, all right, I'm gonna give them Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Um, I just which is a, read the book about that because of your books. <laughs> I looked that up, it looked really cool. A novel, it's a novel about life in a partially collapsed uh, United States. She, the, the main character is from outside Los Angeles. And it's so vivid um, what, yeah, it was so vivid in terms of what breakdown would be like. Octavia Butler wrote this in, I think, the 80s. I, I mean, she's she's uh, like a prophet. In the sequel to Parable of the Sower, there's a presidential candidate who, and he becomes president on the slogan, Make America Great Again. So she really, she really saw the future. Um, I would give them No Ordinary Time by Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's a history of World War II mobilization in the United States. It is the book that, so, so yeah, with Parable of the Sower, you can visualize the future that we're heading towards with No Ordinary Time. You can see how we transformed in order to avoid a terrible future <coughs> in the past. It gave me so much hope. It really shows what a collective undertaking can be. Um, and then, you know, I got to say, I just, given that I'm, Secretary of Education, I'm going to give them my own book so <laughs> they can they can process their emotions of dealing with this incredibly intense collapse uh, and the need for heroic and rapid transformation. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, th my book uh, can support them in that difficult undertaking. And I just will say to everyone out there, I have read the book and I did find it incredibly helpful. I mean, I'm, as a climatologist, I'm, every time I look at the news, it's just like, oh, it's not fun. Um, so thank you so much for what you do. It's, um, it's actually a really big honor to talk to you and thank you again. And um, on the note of your third book, Rebel Rainbow Unicorn, Send me an email at mitch at birdpermaculture.ca and I'll set you up with a copy of that. Yay, and, Rainbow uh, Unicorn. Yeah, woo! All right, Margaret, thank you so much. I uh, wish you a happy and healthy 2021. And um, 
we'll see you out there. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have fun out there. Okay.